Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming here tonight. My name is uh, Seth Manukin. I'm the Associate Director of um, the Chemical and Engineering Department. No, uh, I'm the Associate Director of the MIT Communications Forum, um, which is sponsoring this event, although this is one of those lovely events uh, where we actually just had to get out of the way. Um, and, and William and, and Sarah really put this whole thing together. Uh, so what I'm going to do is introduce William, who will then introduce our four panelists. Um, William Yorkio is a uh, professor of comparative media studies both here uh, and a professor of comparative media history at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, he is the principal investigator both of the Open Documentary Lab uh, which is most relevant to this event, and also um, to the MIT Game Lab. Uh, and in addition to being the principal investigator of the Open Doc Lab, um, the topic of this uh, forum is something he's particularly interested in. Um, he's been looking at shifts in documentary style um, and technology from the 1800s to today uh, for quite some time, and is right now working on a book on that topic. So um, this is also one of the delightful communications forums where instead of having a moderator and panelists, we really have four panelists. Um, only one, I mean five panelists, uh, only one of them also has to serve as the moderator. So without further ado, I give you William. Seth, thanks very much. Um, and I just want to open with a few words of thanks um, to our host, of course, the Communications Forum, um, founded long, long ago by Ithiel de Sola Poole, who some of you may know for his book, Technologies of Freedom. Um, and to our sponsors, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Uh, it's thanks to them that we're here. And actually, we have a convening tomorrow that a lot of the folks in this room are part of. Um, and a shout out to Kathy Im, who's been a delight to work with, the face of MacArthur that we see most. So, um, The program we're in, CMSW, Compared to Media Studies and Writing, has been really helpful. And of course, the Open Doc Lab um, as well. And I just want to mention now, because I'll probably forget by the end, but after this event, there's a reception in the Stata Center, fourth floor. And it's not just a reception, there are demos. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight will be demoed there. And um, you can come and if you haven't seen it before, have fun with it. Uh, I'm just going to try to frame this because I'm not convinced that what we're going to talk about tonight can be taken for granted by um, everyone. What we're basically engaged in is looking at the crossroads, the intersections, the potential synergies between uh, what's happening in the world of digital journalism and what's been happening in interactive and participatory documentary, also a digital domain. Uh, the folks we have here tonight, and I'll introduce them as soon as I sort of blather on a bit, it, it's a, as I wrote to them yesterday, I guess, it's a dream team. This, if you couldn't talk about this topic with four better people, so uh, it's really a delight to be here. Let me just sketch out a few developments that have been happening over the medium to long haul. Documentary and journalism share a lot of concerns. They share an interest in looking at the world critically and helping us to understand how it works, to sort of point out its contradictions and problems, connect us to one another. There's a lot of common ground, and we'll talk about that tonight. But there are also some crucial differences, and those differences sometimes impede communication between both sides. Um, Usually you can see those differences, those tensions, when a new medium enters the world, which it makes now such an interesting moment. Um, as a historian, I'm inclined to look at older media forms. So if I think of when film entered the world, pretty quickly, like by 1907, 1908, newsreels start to appear. And arguably documentaries are around, um, even before John Grierson baptizes them with that name. But certainly by the mid-1920s, when there's a robust documentary tradition on one side and a newsreel tradition on the other, there's huge disdain <laughs> from each side for the other. The documentarians look at newsreels and think, this stuff is superficial, it's quick, it's ephemeral, it's, it's news at its, at its most um, re reduced. And the news people, the journalists look at documentary and say, this stuff is partial, it's reenacted, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got a point of view, an edge, it's creative in all the wrong ways. And more or less from that time till this, these two worlds have existed in different camps. They inhabit different parts, different sort of professional societies. They inhabit different parts of the academy. They have different uh, rule sets. Journalists have a much more stringent rule set than, than documentarians. Um, they're even studied in different parts of the university. 
So that's kind of curious. Like it seems that humanists spend a lot of time looking at documentaries, but not the news. And people in the mass communications and journalism spend a lot of time looking at news, but rarely documentary. So it's funny that these two worlds that share so much in terms of their intervention, so much in terms of what their agenda is, um, in some ways kind of pass, at times pass by like ships in the night. So it's time to put this stuff in perspective and we'll take a crack at that tonight. Secondly, over the long haul, the conventions of both of these areas, both journalism and documentary, have changed a lot. We live in a world where we expect our journalists to be factual, we, we expect a certain kind of uh, distance from the events, a kind of impartiality, maybe even objectivity. It's an elusive uh, category, but there's an expectation of a certain amount of it. And yet, if you look back over the last century or so, you can see that the world of journalism is actually undulated with its conventions. There are periods when facticity is not exactly the issue. It's about being more illustrative than precise, where objectivity is not a, there's no pretext about being objective. The changes ebb and flow, and they, and they fall together with things like the notion of the audience, but we'll talk about that in a flash. They, they have to do with things like technique, what kinds of storytelling uh, strategies are employed, what, what's the use of photography in, in journalism, in print journalism, for example. Documentaries had precisely the same evolution, radically different shifts in style, notions of objectivity, is enactment okay, is it not okay? And I would say in documentary, those undulations have been more frequent than they have been in journalism. But my point is simply to say that what we take as essences today, the truths that we think are self-evident in both of these domains are actually quite culturally contingent, historically contingent. And they're even culturally contingent. In different settings of the world, they play out in different ways. And finally, over the long haul, the idea of who's out there in the seats has really shifted a lot. Beginning of the 20th century, it's the crowd, the mass, that needs to be massaged, shaped, convinced, cajoled. Sometimes it's a citizen, a body of citizens, who we need to, in who we need to inform and engage. Consumers to be cultivated and stimulated. Eyeballs to be counted. Um, collaborators to be worked with. And so these shifts also occur, and they have a lot to do with the mode of address that both documentary and journalism have, how they see their mission, who they're connecting to, who is their audience. So this makes it a fairly wobbly terrain, and I think we're at a point where lots is changing. The notion of the, of the, of the user is changing, that the, obviously the media platforms are changing, and it, it's a moment that allows us to sort of reconfigure these, uh, these two categories. Today, both journalism and documentary face common challenges in the form of threats to sustainability, economic uh, sustainability. Um, they both face pretty significant gaps in their demographic coverage, especially younger people. Um, there's a this series of disruptive changes that have sort of rippled across the media ecosystem, and legacy journalism and legacy documentary have both been hit hard by some of these changes. If I think of something like journalism, you know, in the good old days, I mean, starting from the 1840s onwards, we have wire services, Associated Press, Reuters. And those wire services fed the news as it happened kind of straight to the institutions of journalism who then vetted them, who curated them, who contextualized them, who massaged them into a kind of shape and, 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 and uh, form that we, the public, could sort of make the most of. Well, today, that wire comes right to our pockets, and it's too much. So what do we have? We have aggregators and we have apps that help to parse out our interests. We have algorithms that feed us strategically selected uh, news bits as they happen, more or less, as, at least as they're reported. Without the context, without us really understanding what the editorial view is, um, so this is pretty, you know, we even have listicles, I guess they're called the list, the list obsession that something like BuzzFeed has, and we're sort of reducing the world to a series of, of steps. So the question is how, you know, the, the, how these practices fit with established journalistic traditions is a really good question. And one can be critical about them, but there's also ways in which they engage and might represent something of a next stage that we've got to, we've got to put our minds to. And a paper like The Guardian strikes me as uh, kind of very interesting in this regard because it is trying to get it every way at once. Or if we look at documentary, it might seem at first glance that documentary audiences are certainly the space that documentary gets theatrically is, is not great, is not what it should be. 
And on television, its audiences seem to be missing some demographic sectors. But if you think about the Discovery, Discovery Communications, Inc., this is the home of TLC, and, and just to give the numbers here, 2.7 billion cumulative subscribers in 220 countries, um, dozens of networks. These are the folks who bring us reality-based programming from TLC's Honey Boo Boo to um, Discovery Channel's Yukon Men. Is this stuff documentary? Well, that's a, that's a session in itself, but I would argue to you that it fits many of the notions of documentary that we have. This stuff is reality-based. It's very much about story, telling stories about them. The yield is fairly thin, um, unless one really looks at it as an anthropologist of not so much the people in the, on the screen, but the makers of the, of the product. Um, but it's got a lot of traction. The concern is not so much the representation or misrepresentation of the folks on the other side of the tube. It's that a generation is being trained to understand nonfiction in an incredibly storified, character-driven, sensationalized, banal manner. And that's the, that's the concern, that this starts to become the, the expectation, the frame for the representation of reality. One last data point. A recent, uh, this year, a study in the UK found that in the cohort two years to five years, children between two years and five years old, 29% watched video online daily. And 45% of the 11 to 14 year old cohort watched video online daily. Now, this is my <laughs> the sector of the world I live in and I don't object to that at all, but I find it significant in the sense that, these media that it's a sign that media behaviors are shifting at a very rapid rate. And in fact, they're shifting much quicker than we've seen media behaviors change in the past. And what that points to are some generational mismatches, that many of the folks in the driver's seat of our media organizations are from a very different generation. And what we've got to do is sort out how we're going to come to terms with the citizens of tomorrow, these kids that are, that are learning to, 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 to work their way through the net at a pretty early age. So we're here tonight to explore the changes that are taking place in the world of journalism and documentary as our traditions reinvent themselves, uh, holding fast to what works and reimagining the stuff that we have to address, the weak spots, the reach and relevance where they faltered. The once platform specific operations of print journalism and television or radio journalism and documentary, which was also television and film, have converged on the internet. There's a common platform. And the question is, can we find common cause as these endeavors, these reality-based endeavors, wind up on the same platform? What are the opportunities? What are the implications? Where can we go with this? New production and distribution practices bring with them new affordances. We're seeing this every day. If you just track the job market in, in, uh, in journalism, um, documentary makers are moving to newspapers. Journalists from well-established, well-established journalists from well-established papers are jumping off into startups. There's a lot of churn and mobility just on the job sector right now. Always an interesting indication of where the action is. And, but it's a great moment for cross-fertilization. And, and it's a, in a certain way, although probably devastating to a lot of organizations, especially when job losses are concerned, it's also reassuring in terms of a kind of cross-fertilization, cross-pollination. Digital journalism platforms have proven to be a terrific portal for linear documentaries, and I look at Jason here, but documentaries which are always in need of audiences, they can never get enough audiences, journalism has provided a fantastic new opportunity to bring these products to people who are interested in the world around them. And, um, my suspicion is that some of that has to do with the video form, which is easier to monetize than print in some ways. It's got its own monetization system. Uh, but nevertheless, they're there and it's working. And so the question is, what happens? How can we start to take advantage of what the web can really do? It can serve as a platform to show linear, but the web also allows us to link. It allows us to navigate and move around. It allows us to communicate and connect with one another. It allows people, users, to also participate and contribute. So. Can we imagine a world where those affordances are made better use of uh, in the endeavors, the, the joint endeavors of journalists and document, documentarians? Um, and finally, you know, if we, if we have time after all this, uh, it'd be great if we could discuss what some of the new and emerging tools are. 
the use of wearable technologies, the use of uh, location, the other data sets than just sound and image. What do we do with location data? Is that part of a documentary endeavor? 3D and immersive technologies. So to help us on our way, um, we'll turn to the experts. And I want to start by a really quick round of introductions. And then we'll dig into some questions that will help to open up who these folks are and take it from there. Next to me here is Kat Sizek, a documentary maker for Canada's National Film Board. And she's known for many things, but probably best known for her multi-year, multi-project, really brilliant high-rise series. She's here fresh from picking up an Emmy for one of the project's latest iterations, Short History of the High-Rise, which was an interactive that featured on the pages of the New York Times, thanks to collaborating with Jason and also received Peabody and World Press Association Awards. So it's really been a, a, a very important project, uh, not just in terms of like, I mean, I guess really in terms of the people it touches, but also in this kind of discursive way, institutional way, that's also brought a lot more attention to this set of interactions. Uh, Kat's also a visiting artist here at uh, MIT, and her connection is the Open Doc Lab. Next to Kat is Jason. Uh, Spigarn Koff, a journalist and a documentary maker, someone that wears two hats, uh, and um, New York Times commissioning editor for Opinion Video. And Jason is also a former Knight Fellow in science journalism here at MIT. Uh, and he's, as I mentioned, the person who worked with Kat to make this amazing project uh, come to fruition. Rainey Aronson Rath is uh, next to Jason. And Rainey is the deputy, deputy executive producer of the critically acclaimed public uh, affairs documentary series, Frontline, America's really premier documentary series. Um, she's also here with a handful of freshly minted Emmys. And uh, that's congrats for that. Um, what's interesting with Frontline, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about this, is that it's a, doc, it's a body of documentary that is on the one hand, the best of documentary, but it hews to the strictest of journalistic norms. And that puts it in a very interesting position. And we'll, we'll pursue that constraint or that joy. <laughs> joy, that's so in a, in a sec. And Rainey is also a fellow here at the Open Documentary Lab. And finally, fresh off the plane from London, Francesca Panetta, special projects editor at The Guardian, which is, if you follow this stuff, The Guardian is probably the paper that right now is setting the trend. Uh, for interactive work, where she's really embarked on an incredibly in adventurous exploration of various digital storytelling techniques. Um, really, uh, it, every one of them sort of breaks new ground in terms of uh, both technique and technology, sometimes even folding in live feeds, uh, live data feeds. Um, and if, the, the, if you, you may know some of the projects, things like Firestorm, the First World War, the shirt on your back. She's the only one at this table that lacks an MIT affiliation, and we've, we've got to fix that. <laughs> OK, let's dig into the questions. So Kat, maybe you could just kick, kick it off by telling us a little more about how you, as a documentary maker, wound up on the pages of the New York Times. What was that about? How did that happen? Well, it started here at MIT. It was um, actually the, 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 the short story is that um, you had organized an event before you had even called it the Open Documentary Lab. And uh, Jason met the producer, um, at my producer at the National Film Board of Canada, Jerry, Jerry Flahive. And I think uh, then we all met together a few months later in Toronto at the Hot Docs Film Festival, which is uh, the number one, uh, the largest North American f uh, documentary festival. And, um, and I met Jason and, and, and we all sat down and Jason said, New York City, New York Times, high rises, what do you think? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there's, there's, there's something there. And um, through uh, numerous conversations and really wonderful, like we just hit it off right away in terms of um, the ideas that Jason was bringing in terms of um, what was possible at the New York Times, along with some earlier ideas that we had at, at, at High Rise that we never thought we'd actually get to, which was the history of the High Rise building. Um, Jason quite uh, brilliantly said, well, we have this archive at the New York Times of uh, 8 million undigitized photos, and my mouth dropped open, and, and he said, would you like to see it? <laughs> and that's how it all began, and so, so I spent a week there, and, and the project grew from that, that, uh, that idea. But it was really through, through uh, I mean, you can be traced right back to MIT. So when I gave you a hint of this question, you said you'd also been, a you started life as a journalist? 
I yeah, or, I mean, I, it was interesting. I was listening to your introduction, and I was thinking that I've always struggled because people ask me if I, you know, I, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I always say no. I'm, I don't really call myself a filmmaker because most of the work that I do is not film, has never been film. I, I worked in video, not in, in film when I first started. Um, but I also started as a photojournalist uh, behind the barricades at the Oka Crisis, a student photojournalist, which, um, which is the, the wounded knee of Canada, really. It was a very, very important, significant event in First Nations history in Canada. And um, so I've always kind of, I've gone, I, I've, I've been, I've done what's called journalism, but I've also done what's called documentary. I've done what's called linear film, but I've also always been interested in, in new platforms. So I've never f sat comfortably in any of the categories. So, so this project feels like almost a, a wonderful circling back to everything that I've always, always um, found, the reasons why I do the work that I do, which is photography, history, um, social justice, and, um, and mass audiences. So really wonderful project. And Jason, it sounds like you look for, I mean, here's a great example of a, of a project you spotted and, and reeled in and, or made happen through conversation. But I also, when just looking at, at the website, um, you're, you're open for submissions. And it seems like you get, a, I imagine you get a lot of stuff. You've been in business three years, and people tend to sort of train, they, they get a sense of what someone wants by what they're doing. What are you sensing? What's coming in? Do you get a lot of stuff? Any trends out there? What is the public? Is there much coming from the public, or is it mostly commissioned? Yeah. So the the opdocs section is conceived as an extension of op-ed, and three years ago we we launched this initiative to bring independent filmmakers into the Times because we have a large video jo journalism unit within the the company, and we're currently producing about ten videos a day, mainly from the newsroom. Uh, with a staff of around 50 people. Opdocs is a section for filmmakers outside the Times as part of opinion. So we have some different constraints. Uh, I'm sure we can talk about that. As, as we're teasing out journalism versus documentary, um, what we do is definitely journalism, but it's opinion journalism, which gives some, some more freedom. And because it's an extension of op-ed, it is conceived as this platform for the voice of the public. So uh, we look for filmmakers around the world who are covering anything, really, and, and can use very wide creative latitude from traditional talking head docs, verite, animation, music, or animated storybook rhyming documentary. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, in terms of trends, I think the bread and butter is, is the short form linear Doc, that's I think what we've carved out a nice niche for, and a, a sense that independent filmmakers can find a very wide audience now uh, on on the New York Times, and people are most excited about that. There are definitely interactive pitches coming in, but they're so hard to produce that mm -hmm. there aren't that many. And um, what was so great about the work with CAT and the, the NFB is that we worked on this very early from the concept stage so I could make sure it was appropriate for the Times audience and that we could actually host the project and that it makes sense within our infrastructure and it feels one with the New York Times. There's often work out there that would feel a little bit like we're trying to shoehorn it in, mm -hmm. into the Times. And in, in a linear doc, that's easier to do. We can, we can have something that's very authored that would, it looks like nothing the Times has ever published, but once you're getting into a, a more involved interactive experience, there has to be more, um, more of a fit. Terrific. So Randy, just to maybe extend a little bit from that and to the point I mentioned earlier, so Frontline is, pr is prolific. It makes wonderful uh, stuff and, and relatively a lot of stuff compared to what a lot of other makers can do. Are, are you get, and, and you use, clearly you're using footage that's sent in or at least that you find that's not produced per se from your folks when you need to illustrate a story or where something's mm -hmm. happening where you're not present. How do you, that, that's probably a, a soft spot in terms of that tension between document, documentary where a documentary maker could probably make use of it properly framed and the journalistic mission, which is going to be interested in verification, mm -hmm. accuracy. So how does that play out in your 
neck of the woods? Oh, oh, it's such a it's such a great question. So first of all, I mean, we we always um, have producers or directors who work on the projects with us. So we never really take user generated footage that comes from outside and just simply put it out either digitally or in our films. Um, I would say the biggest change for Frontline has been journalistic more than um, I would say even user generated by the fact of YouTube and the fact that so many local people now are filming their own situations and atrocities that we just would never have access to before. Um, and we have a great relationship with a couple of local journalists in other countries, especially Syria and Iraq, where we've been able to just get incredible scenes from them, citizens basically filming what's happening in their own towns. Um, I would say that the early reporting that we did on ISIS, which was one of the first films that came out with footage of what ISIS was doing last spring, was only because we were able to curate the footage that we were finding on YouTube of these towns being overtaken by ISIS. This is all people with their iPhones or phones just simply loading it onto YouTube. And we worked with a local fixer who could then, and this is the critical part for Frontline, take that user-generated footage, the actual camera footage, and verify it with three or four other people who were at the scene at the time. The other thing that we tend to do is make sure that we don't just have one citizen shooting an incident, especially an atrocity. We make sure we have three or four different people shooting the same thing, which is usually what happens. So if a town's been overtaken by ISIS, for example, and these are in the early days before we even understood what ISIS was, we had to verify that yes, in fact, three or four other people shot this from different angles so that it wasn't staged. We had a situation in Nigeria, um, which William knows about and probably what prompted this question, um, in which we were looking at the Nigerian military's hunt for Boko Haram. And we started to receive um, 120 at the end videos from people who were claiming that the Nigerian military was, um, was basically doing the most horrible acts. And um, that is, goes from slashing people's throats to just mass murder um, in the streets in the name of searching for Boko Haram. And the video was some of the most um, visceral and most uh, realistic video I've ever seen. I mean, you look at it, and there's just no way it could be staged. I mean, you think, you know, and it's very emotional. So we actually then worked again with two local reporters who are really our lifeblood. I have to say the local reporters in these places are the people that we rely on the most. And we were able to verify four of the incidents, but three or four of the incidents that were fed to us, we found were actually Boko Haram actually um, pretending as if they were the Nigerian military. So this is our struggle, is that there's so much media out there, and it's amazing, and it's visceral, and it's powerful. And our responsibility really is journalists first, right? And filmmakers too, but journalists is we still feel this huge responsibility to verify. And in this case, we took on the Nigerian military. It was great, and I think it was righteous. And they, in fact, then had the ambassador <coughs> said that they're going to finally investigate these atrocities. So. That's the other word about journalism. When you verify it and you do the hard work of actually getting the goods, it can have an impact that you just can't determine. But it's so much better than just putting stuff out in the world, in my humble opinion, um, that isn't verified because then it won't have the same kind of um, impact. It can't call a government to task when they're doing something of that sort. So this is really our ethos. And it's complicated, but it's awesome. I mean, come on, it's great stuff. It's better than ever. Francesca, to follow, so you're based in the UK, mm -hmm. and what I always what always strikes me when I when I speak over there is or go to meetings over there is that the the configuration of the overlap between journalism and documentary, and here there's a clear overlap. I mean, we have everyone at this table is an example of of, of that overlap to some extent. But in Britain, it's it's a far greater overlap. Mm -hmm. Like I even have met people for whom the words are more or less synonymous. And, and that's intriguing, but I, but you know you work over there, and I wonder if you could just say a bit about how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of writing, the long form writing in the Guardian is it's feature writing. It's it's not that different from from film documentary. I mean, when I was um, making the Firestorm project, I got the writing from the journalist, and I read it, and I thought, well, do I voice this up as a film, you know, as a documentary script? Because this is how it's written. It it sounds like a documentary already. Um, we've got that tradition 
of kind of long form feature writing and of and of film and of radio. I mean, doc documentary comes in in all in all the mediums, and in our in the newspaper and the Guardian, we have film documentary, we have um, audio pieces, and these they all sit quite happily together in terms of um, kind of long form uh, right long form media, which which gives a particular take on a on a subject. And I mean, I guess that's where I see. The role of the Guardian is not just news; it's not just reporting, and it hasn't been for a really long time. You know, it sees whether it's a written piece or an interactive or a film as um, bringing a, a particular angle to it. So, like the the Guardian's uh, mantra for like a hundred years has been, uh, "Comment is free, but the facts are sacred." So it has to be, you know, it needs to be um, absolutely accurate and verified reporting. But being able to provide some kind of commentary on it, some kind of angle, means that it's not just agency news. And so, you know, I don't see that as being all that different from what documentary is doing. And what's reassuring about that in some way, we, there's some members of one of my classes in this room, but we used a text uh, by Michael Shudson earlier this week. And um, he was talking about turn of the century journalism in the US and he pointed out that around I think between 1890 and 1910 or so that the Sunday newspaper um, outsells the daily three to one mm -hmm. and the price is about it's 300 percent more expensive than mm -hmm. the daily and it's it's interesting when you think today of uh, the ways in which the the news market has kind of been eroded by whatever can shoot it into your pocket the fastest but that role for context and for sort of deep diving, for in long form investigative is, is bigger than ever in a sense. It's expensive. And as the hatchet falls on a lot of news organizations, it's alas the first thing to go. But that's the space where it strikes me that these, where documentary can actually, the, the documentary tr tradition can actually be quite useful. It has you know? to. I mean, I think that, you know, people are providing news for free. So there is, there's no way that people are going to buy that, whether it's in a paper or, um, you know, funding a, a film documentary. It needs to be, needs to provide more than, than what you can get for free out there. So the Guardian at the moment is redefining the whole newsroom and its structure into um, what it sees as live and long form. So, and, and, you know, short, like, short form is not just daily, it's, you know, it's minute by minute yeah. reporting. So live blogs or, you know, stuff that is, um, that is, is very short, very raw, very rough, and then very long form, either whether it's investigative journalism or crafted interactives. And it just sees, no, you know, the space in the middle, it doesn't, it doesn't see it any place at the Guardian for that because there's so much of that already out there. So I'd really love to get your opinions on, um, Interactivity in this context. So interactivity seems to be a terrific affordance. It's it's something a lot of people of are growing up. They're growing up interactive. They they navigate the web. They find their own stuff. There's a sort of taken for grantedness for that. You, the, the the anecdotal evidence you get from teachers in the lower sc high school and grade school is the the challenge of long form linear work. But if it's a project based thing or a thing where students have to sniff around and find it, they're pretty good at it. Uh, clearly, interactive documentary speaks to that space. You can you can take a deep dive where you're interested, or you can move on if you're not. Um, High Rise was great that way. You could really stop and dwell on the photos, or you could just sort of slide across the narrative. But one hears back as a, as a day, sort of a f advocates of long form linear will push back on that and say, well, but then different people have different experiences. The, you know, if the point is to develop a citizenship with common knowledge. One of the great dangers of interactive is that the four of us look at this, five of us look at the same text, and we come out with five different texts that we haven't come out with a common base. Some of us have taken the deep dive, some haven't. Do you see that as a problem or an opportunity? I, I think with, with newspapers, most people just read, you know, read think, the first yeah. few paragraphs and the summary at the end anyway. I think that the idea that we have, you know, dedicated absolute time to watching things and taking everything in in its entirety that you've read, you've bought the Sunday paper and read it from beginning to end is a little bit of a myth. I mean, I, I think that we've, we've browsed through things through history and made our own, you know, made our own narratives through, through that consumption. So I, I think 
is so interesting. I think some, some things should actually still be linear films. They're sure, just made for it. We have this one film that just came in that is an amazing film. And I just watched it and I thought, well, there's no way I really want to break this one up and insert articles and have this, this an interactive around it because it actually authentically <coughs> works as a film. And I bet people will watch it because it's that good. I mean, even younger people, because it's a cool film sure. and they'll be interested in the territory. But I think a lot of times what we're finding at Frontline, which is really where the opportunity is, a lot of times the territory that we take on isn't actually suited that well for a film. It's really restricted to be in a linear format. It would be much better. And, and honestly, like that's why the interactive space is so exciting to me, is some of what we do is quite intense and dense, and having to actually boil it down into a film and have to create that linear narrative is really tough. And it doesn't give enough credit to the body of work around it. So a couple of the projects we've done that are interactive, um, that I, I thought were the most successful have to do with, that was the form they should be in. So I keep thinking like, it's almost like there's the right form for every story you want to tell. If you're flexible enough and you're good enough as a storyteller, you're going to know. This one really needs to be an interactive because you need that flexibility, but this one is the potential of being a beautiful film that would captivate you on television, on your iPad, or in the theater. You know, I just feel like it's like having that flexibility is the key, and that's hugely expansive for Frontline. Well, so, never so been the flexibility, this expansive. the flexibility is really key. The question is how to make that judgment. Um, right. Scott Osterweil, who's sitting in the back, makes a distinction th that I find a very—it's a very useful summation of the debate. And he says, storytelling. Great storytellers have always been with us, and it's the pleasures of, of listening to a wonderful story are not going to disappear. But play is also part of our lives, and we kind of maybe get that disciplined out of us pretty early, but play is another way to engage in narrative, is another way to engage in an experience that's, that's quite different, open-ended, whatever. Mm -hmm. Those two strike me as the poles, and wisdom is understanding which is appropriate when, mm -hmm. and how does one know that? Has I would just say, it, we um, have to apply the same standards to any form, and it doesn't matter if it's interactive, or animated, or an interview, and I think and when you talk about journalism, uh, like as these institutions, these are very old institutions. I, I mean, Frontline in terms of the history of PBS is, is very old. I, it's probably been around since the early days of PBS. Certainly the Guardian. It's years old. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's old enough. <laughs> old, I, enough. old enough. Old enough. Older and than the, five years old. The, the Times is something like 150 <laughs> years old. But I think the, the, the most important thing is to approach any of these projects with the same rigor and um, kind of intellectual and journalistic approach and not to be overly enamored by the technology because the technology is always that, changing. So. Yeah. It's a little bit like if I was fixated on the camera it's shot with. Like, I don't care what camera it's shot with. I care about the story and the rigor and the reporting and the accuracy and the creativity. And, um, and in an interactive piece with, with cats, we put it to the same fact-checking process that we would put any piece of journalism through. And the transparency issues were the same as any piece of journalism. And um, I think the formal aspects are incredibly exciting and, and expansive, but it doesn't change the way we approach anything. Mm -hmm. But you're in the, oh, sorry, I just want to jump in. Um, thoughts from High Rise, which is, in fact, the longest time that I've ever committed to a subject area. It's almost been seven years. So I consider that a, a, a really large documentary gesture from our part. But in the end, when you look at the units of the things that I make, they're sometimes 45 seconds, three minutes long. So I, I, I like to challenge the idea that just because the pieces are short doesn't mean that the idea can't be big in the sense of, of an epic poem, or I think of Manas in Kyrgyzstan, the, the epic story that's told a little bit every night for I don't know how many, how many nights. And, and it's, it's the, the pieces that all add up in, 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 in the re-congregation in, in, in the viewer's uh, experience that I, I find really fascinating um, and, and, and uh, really challenging in, in the high-rise universe. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that Cat's piece is a, 
are, are incredibly successful because they have that kind of rigor and discipline in them, not only of in terms of content, editorial content, but also in terms of what goes in because it's very alluring just to throw all this content in because you can because it's this ever expanding pot, and you know film has to be this length or a newspaper has to be this length, and you can be very sloppy about just you know not editing something tight or just pouring in extra links and extra photos because you can. And, and so you need, you need discipline both in terms of kind of editorial and journalistic rigour, but also creative rigour as well, that you're not making something so sprawling and unmanageable just because the, the interactive form can be like that. You know, all the, the, the crossroads of documentary and journalism certainly have to do with, um, among other things, engaging citizenly activity, informing people, encouraging a kind of yeah, a kind of civic sense, a sense of what's going on in the world around you, enabling people to make decisions in, and navigate that world. Um, and there are a lot of, probably a lot of techniques to do that. And we have, I think we have, there's, there's fairly decent evidence that suggests that when people participate in an endeavor, they're more engaged in it. Now, your projects have often had a participatory dimension. Um, I noticed just even the Times print has, uh, digital anyway, has a lot more space for reader comments than they did. The Guardians are, I, I must say, I spend at least as much time reading reader comments than, I like as I do the articles <laughs> themselves. It's a wonderful way to sort of gauge how, wh what pieces of the story people think have been left out or what they think the cast of the story is. I mean, it's really quite useful. What's your sense of the place of that? We, you know, from, with Rainey, it's about, and Jason too, it's about making sure it's vetted properly. <laughs> But is opinion vettable? Should that, if we, is there a way to inscribe it or, vettable. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I am here to champion opinion journalism and commentary. I think we're aligned with this. It's interesting that the, the Guardian has a comment section as well, right, where you specifically say comment. Comment is free. Part of our website. No, I meant within the paper that you do have a oh, section. Oh, we have a comment page. section, yeah. Right. Yes. And it's yes. just expanded, so we've yeah. just. Comment meaning, I think that's what we'd call it, opinion. Yeah. yeah. Right, commentary. Mm -hmm. But um, there, um, there is no contradiction between journalism and opinion. I mean, that, that's, that's the position of, of the section Amen, which has uh, been around since, I think, 1970. The op-ed op has been around since 1970, and the editorial page has been around for much longer than that, because we have these old framed examples of them from maybe 100 years ago. But uh, I think that the point is, and, and you were speaking about it before, it's more, your, your kind of um, tagline is more eloquent than what I've heard, which is you're, you're entitled to your own opinion but not your own facts, which is just it's a rephrasing. Thing, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we will allow people to say any interesting perspective as long as it can be backed up. And also they have to um, acknowledge the other point of view and we don't allow propaganda. I think there's a difference between propaganda and opinion. Um, but I, I don't like this, uh, if anyone tries to set up uh, some binary opposition between journalism and opinion, I don't think that's valid. Mm -hmm. But uh, where it surfaces is user-generated content where, I mean, Rainey, you're saying you have to scrutinize it in much the same way that you would any other anything yeah, your folks shot. I agree on that though, right? I yeah, don't think yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's tougher it's tougher than ever to verify, but yeah, I mean it's it's richer than ever too. So it's just a couple of added layers. And, and maybe it's maybe it's domain specific because Kat in your case when people are uploading like in the out my window, through my window, that's there's material that people have uploaded there, right? Uh, not in the, in the main site, but right, we do have a participation it, right. site. And the fourth part of the New York Times piece, Short History of High Rise, was uh, thanks to Lexi Mainland, who will be here as well, um, who's the social media uh, editor at the New York Times, had the idea to make a fourth hmm. piece that was entirely comprised of reader submissions of, photo of, 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 of life in high rises around the world. And mm -hmm. so the fourth piece was made of, of that material. Um, but that's not exactly vettable stuff, is it? 
Well, I mean, I think it's, I, it's vettable. Yeah, we, we, we would ask for uh, email addresses and names. And, and often when we were using material, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think the team went and, and <laughs> verified the, the accounts and, and the people. And there's stuff beyond the photo. There are their stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there are many elements to vet and fact check and copy edit. Mm -hmm. And on the archives as well, we had to go through these very old photographs and figure out who, who sh who oh, shot it and like who owns that. the rights to them. That, yeah. Well, even cut lines. I mean, when you right. go into Merlin, which is the, the photo system that is used um, by most major newspapers mm -hmm. around the world um, to manage huge digitized archives, I, I used it extensively uh, with Jason. And um, it, you can't just take the cut line that's written in there and publish it. That all has to be vetted. And, and it was oh. incredible how, how many errors there are in that, system, in that data input system where oh. photographers are just quickly writing in their mm -hmm. captions. Those are not verified facts. And so there's that whole process, too, of, of, of verifying your own mm. systems of managing all this data. I'm going to ask another, but I'm going to open it up. We'll open it up to the audience. And I ask it, use, there's a mic on each side, so please use the mic. Um, and it, it's a question about new technologies or new techniques. This is a fast changing domain. I know that some of you have been looking at 3D systems, mm -hmm. location based, being able to append stories to the places where they happened is, is really a wonderful way to think about the morgue. Also, to put that morgue to use and <laughs> take those old stories and put them up where they, where they happened. Any thoughts on that domain, moving beyond where we are now in terms of uh, technique and technology? Well, I think hmm. something that, that we've all hinted on in, in various respects, which is that tension between interactivity and get, be, becoming immersed in a story. So when do you just let the story take over and, and you become a passive recipient to a story that's unfolding at a pace that the storyteller or the musician have you um, lets it reveal and where, what is the pacing of, of the, the, where you jump in and have to make a choice which breaks that fluidity. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a big question in the immersive experiential stuff like Oculus Rift or documentaries that move into the gaming space mm -hmm. where worlds are created but then how do you tell a story within that space? So how do you, how do you spatialize storytelling and how do you storify spaces? And that's a very, very big question for documentarians and journalists alike, I think. I think it's a huge, it's a huge point is how do you, I mean, that's actually the only reason I'm a fellow is to figure that out because I think, <laughs> I, I honestly, because I think that's the question is how do you, use this amazing technology um, to help actually tell, you know, actually engage ourselves but also younger people in the most important stories of our time. How do we capture their imagination but how do we stay true to, you know, what we believe in which is, which is some form of truth telling. So, and that is storytelling. So it's important. It's hard, but it's important to figure that out. I always imagine It'll keep stuff changing. That, hmm, that hmm. stuff that's process-based would really benefit, let's say, from a game. If you're trying to, if you're trying to, as a, the game as a simulation, say, if you want to mm -hmm. understand the economy, like there's probably no better way you can describe it. I think explanatory work is really there's a lot of an, there's a huge upside. You see that like I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, and the games that they play are explanatory, and they learn so much from them. And they're so deeply engaged as they're learning. So I think there's something, um, and I've been really studying how they learn, because I think it's fascinating. And I think a lot of that could be applied to what we do. If our goal is to really actually engage and, and educate a citizenry, we got to look at this technology. Because the way that they can get you to understand what it is that you're trying to explain is pretty provocative. And it's difficult for some of us who want to really control our universe, but I think it's, it's key. It's key to unlocking this, especially well, for a younger generation. And I think from a documentary perspective, um, how do you make the interactivity poetic? I mean, I think that's Absolutely. the big question. And that's, I mean, I, 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 I keep thinking about Michael Moore. He was at TIFF uh, in Toronto just mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and he put out a manifesto about the documentary, and he disowned the word documentary, and he said that what he mm -hmm. makes is films, not documentaries. And, and I think that's the other side of documentary that we struggle with as documentarians, is this tension between nonfiction and fiction and entertainment mm -hmm. and the feature-length film and how you know documentarians are really just on their way to making fiction. Like, when are you going to grow up and make fiction films? <laughs> is a question I used to often get. And, and, and so there, there's that side of it, too, is the poetics. And how do you, how do you, how do you elevate this to poetry and to, to uh, cinematic um, artistry? And, yeah. I would just add a lot of what happens with great filmmaking and artistry is the emotional experience. And 
in theory, through interactivity, you can deepen an emotional experience and through immersion. Mm -hmm. I imagine at a certain I, point, right. yeah. what scares me a little with Oculus Rift is how um, all-consuming and how effective it can be emotionally and, and some of our responsibility in the nonfiction realm is to temper emotion with um, reality and, and intellect and, 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 critique, and, and, yeah. and, and be careful about being overly manipulative because it's so easy easy to manipulate the viewer and force them into certain you know feelings. I think that's really a good it's a good caution. Yeah. Yeah. So I think as we think about like propaganda versus mm -hmm. documentary, I, I think you could do like some immersive propaganda piece. It'd be very easy to do. Well, they have done it. The, the U.S. military has made a very successful it's game very to recruit. Successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. I've seen that. The other thing about technology is it, it, it's quite boring, but it dates. And your very expensive and beautiful projects just you know, aren't accessible after two years because um, you know, right. Flash doesn't exist anymore or um, you know, that it, it's not supported on, on that particular phone. And um, it's, it's quite dull, but it's extremely important when you're making things specifically for technology. And we don't really like to think about it that much because we like to make these things of them from to be beautiful and use the latest technology. But it's the kind of life of these things is probably mm. something we should consider. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is a really big That's issue. And I, I, I know we're kind of at a transition point and I mean, we're watching technology is changing faster than we can keep up with it, but watching it play out in these forms is, um, it's, it's a rich period. It's very much like the first, to me, the first five to 10 years of cinema where like a million and one ideas were tried and it shook down at a certain point to four or five mm -hmm. mainstream mm -hmm. approaches. But the trick here, and it goes to Kat's point about poetry, if you want the mode of interaction to sort of work with what your topic is, if you want a, 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 a wholeness, if you want a poetic engagement, it, it's much harder to work with off-the-shelf stuff. It sort of means you need programmers and okay. you need designers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which means expense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to sort of say, well, here's, here's a choice of five or six you know, systems. Take one and run mm -hmm. with it. That's where you start to lose the, the haiku of... Uh, <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Please, uh, if you just speak oh. through the mic behind you. Sure. Well, I just wanted to follow up. I guess Jason began it, talking about, I, I, I say, I, here's how I interpret it anyhow. You have material, you become emotionally involved with it. It has an effect on you. But you all work in organizations that have a particular, project a particular ethos. You have, you know, it has a, you represent a certain value system. So how do you, how do you work that, remove yourself, you begin to feel passionate about something and know that it, you have to reform it into a certain way that might be more. In other words, you are all in a group process, but individually you push for certain things that are very, that really affect you. How does that work in an organization, particularly mm -hmm. You have long form Rainey and uh, Francesca. You have new media, so to speak. Katerina, I'll definitely look up your work. I'm sorry I didn't, didn't mm -hmm. see it. So. Um, I would just say um, it depends like who you are as a person. So I'll just speak for myself that um, uh, you know, I firmly believe in, in fair journalism, so I don't believe in objective journalism. So I never believed that, like, you know, A equals B. That was never why I went into it. I really went into journalism because I believed that, especially investigative work, was crucial to our democracy. It was sort of like my religion, if I could say, right? What that means is you may believe something, but um, what I really believe is the most interesting um, work happens when you really report against yourself and report against your assumptions. So I happen to love that intellectual process. Some people hate it, and some of our reporters hate it when I'm like, how, how good is that source? How many sources do you have? Are you sure you've asked the toughest questions of yourself? Because my belief is, and this then tracks with front lines, that if you ask yourself the toughest of questions, right, about your belief system, you'll get closer to the truth. You don't ever get the truth. I mean, what is truth anyway? But you can get closer and closer and closer to understanding 
the problem that you're trying to uncover. And so, I mean, I think that's why our work can sometimes really resonate is because we're, we're trying to take an honest path through really difficult subjects that people have really diametrically opposed points of view on. But if you do that carefully enough, you can get somewhere. So I don't have any conflict with that because I like that. I would build on that by saying it's also in terms of story selection that uh, at least in, in my section, um, we encourage all types of viewpoints on issues. So it's important to also include viewpoints you may disagree with. And viewpoints that are just interesting. I, I think that's often what we're looking for. What's a really interesting take on a subject? And that will help it also rise above all the kind of noise that's out there. So. Um, it doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not, but that's that's a very interesting argument, and uh, you know it should not all be kind of liberal progressive viewpoints. We don't sit around thinking like, how can we find more stories to advance our own pet causes? That's that does not happen. It's more here's an important issue in the world. We've heard a lot of that argument. Let's now put forward some other arguments, and and then then the truth may come about through some of that. But your question really just applies to all journalism. It doesn't really matter yeah, whether it's it interactives or film or... Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, how do you be a good journalist and how do you stay within, you know, the, the editorial line of the particular organisation you're in as well as, you know, having your own ethical values. And I would say, you know, part of that is training. When I was at the BBC, you go through this, you know, mm. course after course of what the BBC <laughs> line is. The Guardian mm. is you know, quite, not quite so kind of... Uh, militant as that, but still, from working in an organisation for a while, you get a very good sense of what those editorial values are. You bring your own values to that as well. It really doesn't matter whether it's for what form it ends up in. It's just, you know, that's how you train as a journalist. I'd say the difference in the only difference in new media is the kind of check. So when I started at The Guardian eight years ago, having come from the BBC, I was suddenly able to make, I came into the podcasting uh, team because I was a radio producer, and nobody asked me what I was making pieces on. No one listened to them. I made them, I uploaded them, then they were out. I didn't have an editor, I didn't have anyone. And so suddenly, you know, from having these really quite strict process they have for the writers going through you know um, subs and editors and commissioning editors you know I had none of that so I think that and, and I was you know has that changed a little <laughs> <laughs> but I mean still no one checks me I commission my own pieces and make them and put them out and I mean, just don't make so many now but um, yeah no it's That's because you know they, these are new kind of slightly wild west areas of you know, one of the wonderful things about working for somewhere like The Guardian, I'm not sure, just like at the New York Times, is you have this kind of huge established organisation which has got wonderful resources in it, but because it's a new area, it is quite Wild West-like. You've got this incredible mm. flexibility mm. and freedom as well, so um, you need to be quite careful of, your, of, of having <laughs> strong journalistic kind of standards there. But I, I would just say that, you know, your question is really just quite a general one on uh, about journalism, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, if you could go up to the mic, and then, yeah, Annika. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Rainey, but by no means restricted to you. Um, I, you gave a really interesting example of working with user-generated content, and that's something that I've done a lot of and I'm really interested in. And uh, I was curious to ask you um, a little bit more about how, in situations where you're working with users, potentially in extremely risky environments, do you talk to them about things like personal safety? How do some of those conversations take place? And how do you handle some of those very sticky issues? That's a really, really great question. And it came up both in the ISIS story and also in the Boko Haram story. Um, we, we actually track down the people who have given the footage to, usually to an intermediary. So we find the actual people who filmed it before we put anything out on, on Frontline. And we go through the same consenting process that we would with an interview. In most of those cases, we did obscure identities. So we made sure that anybody who was identifiable um, as either the, the citizen themselves or somebody in the shot that we thought was inadvertently going to be accused of anything, we would, we would 
certainly, and we did a lot of it, blur a lot of people, especially in the Boko Haram story. But we have this same process. We care a lot about, I mean, we actually, I mean, we care as much about the people filming, right, themselves on their own iPhones as we do our own producers and reporters. In fact, they're much more vulnerable than our journalists because we um, can get our journalists out usually, not all the time, as you guys have seen lately. Um, but I, I do think that we take it very seriously. I think a lot of them are not educated about the risks they're taking, so we go above and beyond. And um, we have been really fortunate, knock on wood, with, the, with that process. But I think it's really important. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Mm. Jim? <clears throat> Please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jim Parody. Uh, Thanks. Comparative Media Studies. I'm very interested in um, how you all think about audience, because obviously mm -hmm. audiences are the great unknown, they change, they shift, and so forth. And I'm very curious about how audience comes into the picture as you think about your work and the crafting of the work. Uh, so that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is with interactivity, how does that formula or whatever, if you have a formula or if you have a practice, how does that shift? So I'll just keep that simple. An audience. We we have a very unusual audience, and um, I think everybody has a different different audiences here. So I think every I hope everybody will answer. But for Frontline, um, we still have a very vital broadcast, and a lot of people still watch us. Millions every week come to Frontline on television. They watch us in real time. That's kind of amazing to me because I never do anything in real time anymore. Um, but what's <laughs> remarkable is that that's that's our sort of core audience, and they come every single time. We have a fresh film. Um, what's been really amazing for us is digitally our audience is going through the roof like the numbers are incredible and that audience is much younger um, they tend to be in their 20s and 30s and early 40s and they come to us and they do all sorts of different things in our television audience they love to give us their email because we don't fundraise off of them and they love to interact with us online, which I find to be the most incredible thing that all of a sudden we have a very active community. So um, that's our growing community. So we think about them all the time. And that means we do um, different things, actually. We put things in shorter form. But I think we should do that anyway. So it's not like we're just serving the audience. But we do all sorts of things like publish daily as opposed to just waiting for a big film to come out. And we notice that. This audience also loves our longer form films. So they come, they, they watch for an incredible length of time. But like you said, this, there's a myth that people watch the whole thing, even on television, right? We don't know what people are doing in their living rooms. They could be going and getting a Coke or coffee or whatever. But you can tell when people are watching online a little bit better, and they stay for a while. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty um, optimistic trend watching how our audience is growing online. I can say the same for the National Film Board of Canada. We, we sort of did two very large digitizing projects at the same time. One was begin creating work specifically for the digital space. We have, beyond High Rise, there's two other studios. There's, a, there's an English a digital studio and a French digi digital studio that produce specifically digital work. But the other thing that the NFB has done is gone into its 75-year history and pulled out over, I think, three or 4,000 films now and streamed them online. Um, and that's a, that was a mammoth project in terms of rights and clearing everything and getting it up and running. Um, but we find our audiences uh, very similar to yours that um, the completion rates are phenomenal. People watch long form for a long time on, online. We don't have any problems with that at all. Um, and then the other part of our the, uh, the interactive work that we've created, the documentaries um, specifically made for the digital space, um, usually our first audience, we have multiple, we call them sort of ripple effect audiences. So our first audiences tend to be early adopters, so people that are interested in the technology. So for example, um, I made the first WebGL documentary several years ago called One Millionth Tower. It was featured on Wired.com for 48 hours because of the technology we used. But the tweet that really represents how our audiences reacted to the work is that um, somebody said, I came for the technology, stayed for the story. And so then once, once people are kind of interested, people that are really into technology, they, oh, WebGL is so cool. And they're like, oh, wait a second. This is about city renewal and, and urban planning and citizenship. And they got really into it. 
and linked it to their own ideas about technology. Um, and then you get the educators, and then you get the five. Year We've had tweets from five-year-olds talking about spending, you know, 40 minutes on out my window. So it really ripples out. Um, but definitely, in our experience, usually it's the people that are really interested in technology because those are the people that are on on the net looking for new stuff. So that's a bit of explanation of ours. I would add two two quick things. Um, a huge buzzword around our office these days is audience development, mm -hmm. where we have a new masthead position, which is like one of the most senior editors, it's staffing up a whole group now in trying to find new ways of reaching people with New York Times content. So this is like a really big idea that we're exploring. But the other thing is how do you give kind of pleasure and satisfaction to your audience, not just reaching more people, but how do you kind of satisfy them? and challenge them and I think that's that's the most fun thing to kind of test their interests and um, broaden the sense of of what you can publish because like I have the I feel fortunate to be able to experiment and do things where people say wow I, I never expected the New York Times to do that um, well the rhyming couplet is a really good example the rhyming cup yes who would have expected Very a rhyming right some people hated that <laughs> In terms of the audience, about half our comments are how much they hate rhyming, and why is the New York Times doing a rhyming storybook? But that's I don't, okay. I don't come to the, New York, <laughs> the front pages of the New York Times to get, you know, rhymes. Right, right, right. Um, right. But then that's also com that, that's an interesting um, uh, example of how hmm. who comments. You know, who are your commenters on a site? Those aren't necessarily that's right. not necessarily the general audience. If you went to Twitter, you weren't. You, we didn't see that kind of commentary because on Twitter you're probably seeing new audiences talking about a New York Times piece, whereas commenters were more likely the, right. the hardcore New York Times readers who found this out of the ordinary. So you have to kind of gauge who you're listening to and where they're coming from as well. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I mean, different groups are all, I mean, definitely the Twitter audience is very different than those who comment on our website or different from our Facebook audience or different from the people who comment on YouTube. I mean, yeah. it's a totally different. The YouTube comments are really interesting. What are they like? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're oh, yeah. really supportive of our extreme journalism in the field. They love it. Like when, you know, you know, it's when it's more, I suppose, I don't like to say Vice-like because we're frontline, but actually I love Vice and I watch Vice. But the point is they love that kind of work when it's really visceral. They're much less interested when we have talking heads in our films and they just tell us, you know, this mm. is boring. They're not into it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we hear you. So, uh, Elspeth. Thank you. Thanks for letting me stay in my chair and <laughs> use the mic. So, I had two questions. Um, Randy was very eloquent about having flexibility and choice about uh, uh, regular kind of linear storytelling versus interactive, and she said what kind of, in a way, what kind of uh, piece was good for linear. I was wondering from any of you, what kind of a story is most, um, is best treated as an I interactive story? So, so that was my first question for any of you. And the second is, none of you really talked about platform and how your audiences are, are interacting with your material, what devices, what, you know, mm -hmm. and does that matter in terms of how you are producing what you're doing? Mm. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Go ahead. For story. I talk, shall I talk about platform? Because um, yeah. you know, it's something that we're really obsessed by at The Guardian because everyone is now moving on to mobile. I mean, that's the general trend anyway. But you know, people for news are checking their phones you know, several times a day on mobile. And it's a huge challenge when we want to make these really beautiful, fancy interactives. And what does that look like on a really tiny screen? Um, so you know, we're being really encouraged to think about making, trying to make some projects next year that maybe, you know, come from a mobile point of view. Mm. I, I mean, I think for us, I, there, kind of wearable technology and, and things like that are, go are going to be exciting, but really mobile is the key for us at the moment. I would say the tablet for Frontline is the most friendly right now in the forum that we are most, which is the linear doc. And so it's just because people are leaning back and experiencing the films, and those numbers have like skyrocketed. Um, and I think on smaller phones and mobile, 
people are watching for longer than you would think. And we have the same challenge on interactive, and we have the same project where we're looking at shorter form interactive. But I would say journalistically why I like interactive so much is, especially when we're doing collaborations with our partners at the New York Times and other places, I'm finding a very comfortable home in the interactive space to do truly collaborative work with our text partners and still photographers and people so that we can combine our mediums. That's where I'm the most excited is when we're working with like the ProPublicas and those folks where we're trying to think about how can we crack our own forms together when the reporting is really deep and when I feel like the linear documentary can, can restrict it is really just amazing, like what the potential is with our partners. That's where I'm most excited. Hmm. Well, in terms of platform, some of our work um, is around half mobile. Um, oh. Half the audience is on mobile. So it's, on it's not a theoretical it's, yeah. question yeah. at all. It's it's, not, we are yeah. dealing it with uh, this week, um, looking at the, the t you know, desktop experience and the mobile experience. And it's very challenging uh, as you're designing, because you want to have cross-platform pieces, and you, and you want to serve up the full experience on mobile mm -hmm. without what you can't do is, is put up a, a black card that says, go, go to your laptop computer to watch this video. <laughs> you have to give them something. Well, I did that um, two years ago for a project, and I just got hauled in and said, you can never do that again. You can't make a Guardian project that does not work on mobile. It's yeah. not allowed, because you lose half of the audience. And, and, so. and thinking about gesture, and, and with maybe you could talk about how you thought about tablet with high rise. Yeah, the, the concept for the high rise, the short history of high rise was, was um, inspired by the storybooks, the children's books that have been developed mm -hmm. for tablets. And uh, so that was the that, that was kind of the tactile inspiration for it. And um, Jackie Mint, who is the phenomenal designer and developer at the New York Times, with whom I had the pleasure of working, um, uh, we, we, we worked out a way in which we could do that in browser so um, that you don't have to download an app or it's, it's all right there. Um, and there's real limitations, even in a very, you know, the, 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 it was beautifully coded and beautifully designed, but technologically it wasn't actually that complex. Um, but even still, there were some really big uh, constrictions, especially on audio. You can't do any crossfades on mobile. You have to trigger every yeah. video. Like there's just all these things that really limit the uh, rich experience in the mobile environment that, that uh, we're just really waiting for, for the, the WebGL and for the, the, the power of the mm -hmm. mobile to, to kind of catch up to, to the kinds of things that we're able to do yeah. on desktop. So that's a huge limitation for me as an artist uh, working in the mobile world. You're able to use gesture yeah, in an interesting right. like way. Touching. Yeah. yeah. But we have to, the technology has to catch up because everybody's on mobile, so we're waiting. We're almost waiting. You know, it's so interesting as people are just in droves going to mobile in smaller format. It's just then if the technology catches up with our creative visions, that would be, that will happen. That's why we're at MIT, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you. Hi. Uh, my question is about. Um, audience perception and the ethical issues that you just mm -hmm. said uh, when micro mode he claims what he made is not documentary that's just film but the audience won't think so they will think oh you are a documentary filmmaker mm -hmm. and you are the, one of the best and if micro mode stage something that will be a big disaster and the same applies to other fields like the for the games if you make a game with documentary people will say oh it, it's just a game it's nothing serious and for the like the radio is the same for the radio drama the war of the wars first came the people don't think that's a drama it's just uh, thinking about the martians are invading our world so what do you think about this and do you think are you thinking about educating the audience or inter interacting mm -hmm. with them um, can we say both sure i mean i the, the one idea I would put forward is this very basic journalistic concept of transparency, where you can kind of do anything as long as you tell the audience what you're doing. And uh, it's a very simple idea, but it's actually hard to do in practice. And certain projects become very difficult to tell the audience what's going on here. Like, if there's a real mashup between fiction and nonfiction, and mm -hmm. 
how are you going to explain mm -hmm. to people what's real and what's not and some pieces we can't work with because they're just too complicated. Other pieces you come up with a that. very creative solution like we did this musical mashup piece where there were real lines spoken by Mitt Romney turned into a musical song and we wound up having an online article that went with it with all the lyrics and links to every line so you could see the original video clips. Oh, so, sourcing everything. To source that. it. That's what yeah. that was. Yeah. yeah. So they're, you know, sometimes they're creative solutions, but I think we have a lot of responsibility. But it does beg the question. I mean, so one of the problems, if you look at the market erosion that the BuzzFeed's Vices, Voxes have had, it's because they're working with niche audiences in a sense where they can kind of they kind of know what the literacy level is technologically, as well as aesthetically even, in ways where I think all of you here are working with probably broader audiences that are more broadly conceived. The audience that you've had, the the, the true viewers of uh, Frontline, as well as those who you can do something different for the online folks because they're probably different. But how how niche can you be and still do the work you're doing in terms of your imagination of the audience, your conception of the audience? We're, Frontline's very small, so there's only a few of us making you know bigger decisions about um, what we do. And one of the interesting things um, is coming to Frontline. You know, it is 30 years old, so it is old. Um, is people would be like, well, Frontline doesn't do that. And I would look around and say, well, where's Frontline? Wait, aren't we Frontline? You know? And so this really opened up a whole dialogue about what are we, who are we, which may be a little bit different if you have a huge institution where um, you have so many different departments. But for us, it was um, just freeing up the conversation about what we could do. And that was the crucial turning point. And you know, also, the other big difference is that Frontline's always streamed its film very early. So, you know, the, the David Fanning has always believed in being digital first. So, there's never been a sort of restriction on that front. But I do think that we still maintain some very strong journalistic rules, especially, I mean, we could talk about some of this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, provocative moments that we've been faced with where we've had to, like Jason said, just say, sorry, we can't do that. You know, it's not going to work for us. Yeah, yeah. Sean? Um, uh, I'm curious if um, you could talk a little bit about if, you've, if any of you have kind of encountered resistance within your organizations, particularly around kind of some of the more experimental interactive work, um, and particularly at times when it's, you know, kind of costly. Like how, how are you kind of weighing the sort of cost benefit um, and the sort of balance between the traditional work that you've done, whether it's print journalism or long form video and you know some of these forms that are a little bit um, more kind of um, untested and, and aren't always guaranteed to reach audiences or the audiences that you might expect? Um, well, generally there's a kind of confusion about what these are. So when I work with a journalist or with an editor or um, they want, first thing they want to know is what it's going to be. Um, and what they mm. need to do, and you say, well, we're still working on the concept, and we're not entirely sure what it's going to be yet. Um, mm. That's really confusing for journalists, because they're so used to having a very clear brief. So I was um, working with a journalist on a Bangladesh project earlier this year, and he just wanted to know, you know, how many words, literally, and what, they, what I roughly wanted them to say. Mm. Um, so he delivered, I think, about... Um, he delivers about 10,000 words to me in the end, which I used about 3,000 3, words of. And he was, you know, quite upset about that. But when he saw the piece at the end and it all came together, he understood that, you know, the writing had formed, you know, the whole structure of the piece and the data and the graphics that went in all came from his writing. But it, it, it's quite confusing um, for, for, for journalists to... <coughs> to understand the process that it's going to take six months to make um, and, and what you need from them and how they're going to fit into it. I'd say there's less resistance about... Um, lots of people, I find at The Guardian anyway, everyone wants to get involved in making these things because they, they see them as being kind of shiny and sparkly and, yeah, we want to be part of, of making one of these, but they, don't, they just don't kind of understand really what they are. Um, and also, I think that there, you know, the new media are is is, you know, when I when I started working in multimedia 
and the Guardian. I was being asked, kind of, you know, how, how, why are they funding these radio studios and TV studios that they're building in the Guardian? Why this is very expensive? But actually, journalism is expensive. Investigative journalism is expensive, and you know, why, in a way, why do we need to um, justify this different part of journalism when, you know, there's a huge amount of of, of costs for the for the Guardian how it exists, and I think that that is now being seen as, you know, that all of these different elements are part of the way that we tell stories and, and report, and, and that we don't need to justify ourselves. Just because we're a new edition, we do not need to justify ourselves. <laughs> One of the things I've really been, I've liked a lot in The Guardian is the way that it offers links to readers. So an article will, I mean, it's usually your own articles, or it might be an interactive data set, but the way in which you're able to sort of remine your morgue, in a sense, stuff that that's that popped up two or three weeks ago, but it'll still get linked up as a as a subhead that you can go to if you want to know more about the story. Uh -huh. Turning even ordinary print stories into a more interactive uh, as in as in hyperlink within the text. Yeah, so when we have absolutely been encouraged to do that since we went online because <sighs> it's seen as a you know, hugely important part of telling that story. Yeah, it makes great use of your other resources, allows users yeah. to sort of deepen their knowledge of, of the story. Yeah. I and put a link in yesterday to a Guardian article. Hey. And there were competitors. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best article. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so my question is somewhat related to the earlier question, um, which is, uh, well, I feel like I'm one of the early adopters that Kat talked about. I'm a software developer, so you know when I go and check out this story that MV, NFB put up, I'm really excited about, about the technology. Um, and, and I'm wondering, how do organizations decide the impact of these new media pieces? And, and I know, you know people understand intuitively that you know, the audience is changing and we're moving away from just you know, text and like, you know, younger people want to see more. But how do we really know that? You know, are, and, and what are the metrics? Are there any standard metrics that organizations are coming up with to measure the effectiveness and the impact of new media stories? That's the $64,000 question. Well, Bingo! <laughs> we know how many people yeah. click on them. Um, sometimes we know how long they spend on them. Um, I would say that success for a project isn't always just how many hits there are because like if we put up a, a panda photo gallery it is going to get a lot more hits than an interactive <laughs> about the Bangladesh clothing industry that I've spent six months on it's just and the Guardian knows that you know it knows that if it wants lots of hits you know it needs to put you know kit kitten galleries will do it um, and I think it does have a lot of integrity as an organisation that that's not, we don't only measure, measure success through, through hits. Um, so these specific interactives are seen, their success is also on how it's kind of regarded within, you know, within these circles, how they're peer reviewed. Um, but most importantly, I think, whether just internally, whether we think they tell stories well, and that's incredibly subjective. But in the end of the day, you know, we're, the Guardian is looking around at different ways of telling stories, whether it's through Twitter, whether it's through live blogs, whether it's through interactives, and it's looking at them going, actually, does that, do we think that works or not? And if it doesn't, um, then it will kind of throw it out of the way. I mean, Guardian has, has been very kind of agile since it became digital, and just like trying loads of stuff mm -hmm. um, in a quite kind of haphazard, chaotic way, seeing what sticks onto the wall and the rest kind of falls off. And I guess we, we, we look at these projects and go, uh, does this tell this story well? And if so, we'll try and do more of them and we'll try and do them better. Um, so yeah, that's for the Guardian, that's probably our, my answer. I'd say we judge everything the same way we judge our films and our tra more traditional filmmaking. It's, it's the same thing. It's, it's similar in the sense that you do know how many people come to it, but um, most journalistic news organizations don't just base everything on the numbers, or we would do pandas. But you do care <laughs> about the form, and I think that's you know another reason to be an MIT is to really sort of crack the code on what's the right form for for a news organization like Frontline, right? There's going to be a special sort of storytelling that we do that's going to be different, and 
The other thing I would say is that a lot of the um, most recent work that is interactive that I've, I've appreciated the most is when it is cross-platform with other news organizations. And that's when I've seen the biggest impact is frankly when we're working with two or three other news organizations and then you just see not just the numbers but the engagement go through the roof because we're presenting it so many different ways. And that's where I get really excited. I think that's crucial. I know that at the National Film Board of Canada, our mandate isn't just to reach wide audiences. It's, it's an important part of what we do. Um, but it's also to try and understand um, the social impact beyond what you can measure at the, at the keyboard. And I know that, um, that you at MIT are doing a project on measuring how, how organizations are measuring impact. So there's really important work being done here in, in collaboration with TFI. Uh, about how to measure beyond those numbers, those quanti quantitative numbers, and look at uh, broader, uh, deeper social impact, social imp policy impact, um, impact on sensitivity trading or education, all, all those very difficult things to tangibly uh, measure. So Impact is, stuff to, is very tough to report on. Exactly. That's one of the biggest challenges is what is impact, and that's very subjective too. So what we think is impactful will be very different than another news organization or even a citizen, what they think is impactful. So that's, that's another, that'll be your challenge. Philip Napoli was here a couple of weeks ago. I don't see him, he'll be here tomorrow in any case. And he spoke, um, I mean he made a really good point that the very fact of a journalistic organization, the fact that a community has a newspaper, whether it's read or not, the fact that it exists is already a deterrent to all kinds of egregious behavior. I think for that fear that's that it true. might show right. up. In other words, it's not about reading the story or the expose, it's about the fact that there could be the expose that has people. Mm -hmm. So what they've been doing are, is looking at communities with papers and newspaper, uh, communities without to sort of give this some substance. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it's an interesting, again, one of those things we don't usually think about with impact. Mm -hmm the fact that there's a newspaper mm. there. but That was one of my first print experiences. We started a, a, a newspaper in the James Bay Cree region in the nine Cree communities. Um, and uh, before then, there had never been uh, a newspaper. There had never been ink covering the news in that area. It was always radio journalism. And within three years, I think, all the leadership <coughs> in all the communities had, had fallen because of the impact of the newspaper. Wow, yeah. wow that's great. Hi, I'm um, the digital editor at Le Monde in Paris, and I'm a Neiman Fellow, and we struggle with the same thing as you guys. And I was following up on, on the question of, about data, but don't you have ways to meter, to monitor data inside interactive features to see how people choose or click on stuff? I mean, not, not only the figures, I mean, how much people click on stuff, but how, um, and not only how long they stay on the page, but what they do. And, and then my question is, uh, what kind of lessons do you have from this? I mean, do you decide, when you say we, we put a lot of stuff on the web and we see what sticks on the wall, we do exactly the same thing, but when we have a hard time, but then we have a hard time to determine if something sticks on the wall, can we deploy something from this? Can we like have an industrialized way to do this stuff again and again because it works well with the audience? And most of the time, it doesn't. So I was wondering if you had any experiences of this type. I do know that Knight came in to fund us on one of our big um, new efforts. And they're actually saying that we need to actually answer that question. In part, they want to know how much can you learn about what users are doing with what they're experiencing. So I think that that's like a whole new wild west of really understanding what people do once they're experiencing something beyond how long they stay and how many people come. And it's, it is the impact question. It comes down to that again. And now there's a couple of these audience development groups that are actually specializing in helping us figure that out. So I mean, it's, I think it's really rich territory to understand that. I think key to what we believe as journalists, though, which is the interesting corollary, is we still have to do work, right, regardless of what we think the audience wants. I mean, and not as simple as do we put a panda bear up who's so cute, but you know, there are often times that we come, we, we're doing journalism that we don't really know that the public would even know about. You know, and we, don't, we know they're not going to watch it in droves, but we think it's important. So I think that's like one of the things I hope we can keep near and dear as we learn more and more about audience usage is, is that tradition of journalism. Well, um, the earnest side, you know. I think whoever, maybe it's from the Open Doc Lab, but who, whoever could carve out a niche in 
understanding this would have a great job. Yeah. Uh, and that every, every news organization will need somebody. Like I would love mm. to have this like consultant on hand and yeah. every morning I go in and say, show me the boards and they put up, you know, shh, and, you know explaining Well, they are starting every, to do that. <laughs> well, but it's, it's hard. Well, we have, we have these analytics groups, and I can request reports, and they're, they're really cool with like pie charts and stuff saying what percentage of people are coming from social and mobile and which countries. And, but what's often hard to understand is why people, like how do you interpret the data? Like you can understand how long people are on a site and stuff like that, but why are they making certain decisions? Like right like now I'm trying to find out a commenting question. Like why aren't there more comments? Like there's gotta be more comments. Is it a design issue, a technology issue? Do people just really not have much to say about this issue? I thought they had a lot to say, but you know, kind of, it's hard. Maybe we need focus groups rather than analytics. Maybe it's old school. I mean it's I a know. classic, it's a classic paradigm battle between yeah. them quantitative qualitative approach one's really easy to generalize but the other but it's kind of thin and the other is terrifically deep but what do you do with it we just built a UX lab which I mean this is before rather than after launching but this is a huge thing for the Guardian to actually you know kind of care that much about how people are going to interact with these things not just interactors for the whole website um, which kind of you know, tracks the eye movement and the, you know, mm. what people are doing with their mouse and where they're moving on the screen. And so they test out various parts of mm. you know, the football site, for instance. They've just done this huge case study on you know, where people are, are moving the mouse and if they design the, the, the home page in different ways, what happens. So they, there is a kind of, they are kind of moving in that direction, but it's quite expensive and specialist, as you know. And, um, takes quite a lot of investment as well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if any of you had any insight on kind of future of where we're going to get financing for these projects, especially once they start getting <laughs> more complicated with mm -hmm. Oculus Rift and 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 if there's maybe kind of a, a fee for for accessing these kind of documentaries mm -hmm. or, or short form um, projects um, once they do start costing a lot more. Um, so that's my. I think that's actually a great question. That's come up um, and amongst the fellows a lot um, in the Open Doc Lab. That I think, and William and I have talked about this. That one of the um, the things we've seen in documentary in general is that the costs have been going down, right? So production has just been less and less expensive as cameras have gotten smaller, and one person can shoot and produce. And so this is the opposite direction. And so if I were you. I would identify the news organizations um, or the small centers of innovation that are starting to pop up practically everywhere and, and start pitching, but pitch with a really good idea. Um, what's been interesting for us is that we get huge amounts of pitches on for films, just linear films. We get pitched all day long, every single day. But on the interactive side, um, the stories, and I think it may have to do with something that you, you, you were talking about, which is it's so hard to describe these projects before you build them that I would just counsel people who want to start making interactive films or whatever you want to call them to be able to describe them at least a little especially to somebody like me, that would be awesome. Like I, and I really have had these amazing circular discussions, ooh, sorry about that, um, in which I, I haven't really understood what it is that the person wanted to do enough to even understand if we could potentially fund them. And that's a big challenge, I know, before you've built it. And you would speak to that more eloquently than I could. But I do think that would be helpful. <laughs> And a few pictures too, like just a few little hand-drawn sketches and wireframes. Just that would help too. Really helps when you're pitching. Yeah, a visual, a visual, visual pitch helps in these yeah. cases, really, really, truly. Andrew. Hi. Uh, I just want to go back to uh, a comment that I think that Jason made just a few minutes ago, talking about why aren't there enough comments or more comments. It, I was. I thought about uh, a Pew Research uh, study that just came out a couple of weeks ago, talking about how. Social media is really creating Twitter, Facebook's creating these echo chambers. In so much, they become empty chambers. That's why maybe potentially there's a lack of comment. So I'm wondering if the idea of trying to and 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 the result. I mean, the study from that talked about how that was maybe with the result of feeling like 
they're uncomfortable to say something in their own opinion because in these in Facebook and Twitter, we're allowed to surround ourselves with like minds, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not. It's mm -hmm. we don't want to be challenged by the opposing views. I'm wondering if folks in the panel or even folks in the room, if there are research or other studies that's happening to really find a way to get the conversation happening between polarizing issues. You know, how can we get Fox News audience to watch CNN and CNN to watch Fox and so forth to really have a, a real debate? So I'm just wondering if, if there's any work on that space. I think if people um, trust the organization, like, like with the Times, uh, when we have published opdocs on immigration issues, filmmakers have often been surprised at the number of conservative comments. They were maybe thinking they'd be in a, in a kind of home team crowd. <laughs> but in fact, you know, some very uh, passionate, sometimes well-argued commentary kind of slamming the, probably the position of the filmmaker. So I think that's a, that's a healthy sign that what we're doing has enough integrity, that it's a safe space for, for opposing arguments. But, but that's, that's what I see. That Pew research was really provocative. It's, it's, it's hard to see that happening. But I do think there's, you know, especially with younger people, they don't even really identify with a news organization. So I imagine that these forums are going to happen apart from us to a large degree where, you know, multi-opinioned, formats and forums are going to start to pop up because curious young people are going to want to create them. I mean, that's another way to look at it, is I hope those types of forums are created. The Guardian seems to get some amount of those, those debates that span political stances. And I think Jeez, it's because, yeah. in part, it's a British thing, but it's also time of day. <laughs> like, you can sort of see when the Americans are awake. Yeah. <laughs> and they come into the debate. They because, do. Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, they usually often self-describe. If it's a hot enough mm. topic, they'll self-describe as. And, um, and then they'll get British responses. I mean, but it's a space for robust debate yeah. very often. And it's interesting, because the, you know, the Guardian reader is such a stereotype. And yet, online, it seems to have got a, a much wider audience. Um, which I think it's been very, you know, very pleased to see that, you know, what we're all trying to do is in mm -hmm. widen our audience and that it is possible. That's true for Frontline, too. Mm. So a question surprised. about data visualization and interactive <laughs> data visualization. Um, we've got the tools, we've got the data. That's certainly a growth area. What kind of uses are you, fi are you finding that? Are those helpful developments or are those just ways to parse what's... Uh, so I think easily available. Our, I think our challenge as kind of interactive documentary makers is to make them um, kind of emotional and meaningful <laughs> because there are some amazing data visualizations out there, but because they don't have narrative and the kind of time el element to them, they can feel very dry and very cold. And um, I actually think that's probably the next step for, for all of us is, is how to bring narrative and emotion into to data viz, which I think is, is such huge potential there for us. Um, but there hasn't been that much done, um, I, don't think, I, I don't think, that really grabs you by the heart and pulls you in. Yeah, right now it mostly seems to be framing strategies to sort of make you understand why the data is relevant. Mm -hmm. There was one that you guys showed about gun control that was so emotional. I, I wish we had it up here, Sarah. Do you remember? Maybe you can shoot it around to people or Sean. It was unbelievable. If you, if you all take a look at this, you'll see what you're talking about. The potential mm -hmm. of having data viz actually touch you. Was, I was shocked by that. What, what is it called? What's it? It's by uh, Periscopic. It's a data visualization studio. <laughs> it's really cool. worth looking at. It's, it was really quite something. <laughs> And I mean, you probably, it's on our Moments of Innovation website. There's the data it's viz from the mid-19th yeah, century, beautiful. Menard's yeah. visualization of French troops going into Russia and coming back. And it's sort of beige and robust marching yeah. in. And it's a timeline as well as a, 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 a terrain map. And what goes in really huge comes out as a trickle. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a tearjerker of a, I mean, I, there aren't that many data visualizations that bring tears to your eyes. Mm -hmm. And this is one that. Yeah, does the trick with me anyway. Um, okay. Periscopic data visualization. 
okay. periscope. <laughs> it's really short, but it'll just, it'll, it's really quite something. Guns.periscopic.com. Mm. It'll trouble you. I just stepped out, so maybe you, somebody asked the question I was going to ask. So we've been talking about technologies, but primarily interactivity. So lots of other things have happened to journalism in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Mm -hmm. And visualization is one, uh, the ways in which mapping and so forth and representation of content through visual uh, delivery. There's so many different things that have happened. So. I'm just wondering what maybe two or three other major areas of change and shift uh, uh, through technologies and in, uh, innovations uh, are on your minds. Well, I like to I like to give a really crude example, um, just because it's a really nice counter to what I do, which is um, kind of journalism by Twitter. Like one of our um, one of our journalists, John Henley, who actually wrote the beautiful text for Firestorm, also did a whole load of reporting using Twitter, getting people to send him to different places to, to do the reporting. And actually, during the London riots as well, another one of our reporters did that. It was basically being, being fielded around London by people using Twitter. And you know, I think that, uh, that technology can, in, a, in really cheap, and kind of quite crude ways be really powerful in terms of where it's driving journalism. Did you mean additional technologies that are impacting journalism or just different? Yeah, uh, technologies have changed the way journalists, uh, there was an article in uh, the Globe Sunday, I won't remember the title of it, but it was just about reporting in the Middle East and how uh, uh, reports are coming in from people who aren't, don't even consider themselves journalists, who are putting together information from a variety of sources and how their information is better than anybody else's, but uh, the problem is, is checking it and getting it accurate uh, because the professional element isn't there. But, you know, there, there are these changes, these organic changes that are taking place in this, this terrain, and so I'm just curious about what you see as uh, one or two. The thing I would mention is drones. Mm -hmm. Drones, uh, footage is amazing. I got uh, there. I'm working with this filmmaker who's in China with this incredible footage that I thought was like stock footage, just aerial footage. It's like, where did you license that footage? He's like, oh no, I shot that footage with a drone. Just, I got the cool. best drone operator, and it's like, wow, that's impressive. Really. Security, though, because they're called a drone. That's the other thing. We've got to rename those things, something else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, uh, Quadricopters. Exactly, yeah. but and it's beautiful. And journalists are, I know the Times has been thinking about how to use them for news coverage, for a lot of interesting things you could do in terms of, you know, like measuring sizes of crowds or all sorts of news gathering applications. But the laws are, are yeah. iffy there. Domestic drones are not permitted in a lot of situations. And I would just argue that um, <clears throat> the, the push in technology and these new technologies that are challenging us in so many ways in our daily lives and in our professional and, and working lives, um, beyond the technology, I think what's really important to remember is how it's shifting our entire methodology as a documentarian. I think uh, what the new media has afforded, just like you say, is citizen journalism, participatory methods that really challenge some of the, the, the troublesome and troubling elements of our practice, uh, this, the exploitative um, uh, ways in which we have told, told stories, um, the way in which certain voices have been shut out of stories, all those really deep questions that these technologies are making us face um, is really important and, it, and also breaking down the boundaries um, and the silos between journalism and documentary and even fiction. And I would argue uh, going beyond that, uh, looking at how, uh, for me, documentary um, can work with theater and can work with performance in, in really deep and profound ways that, that, uh, that renew some old traditions and create new ones in, in the way that we search for meaning and, and justice. Kat, that's those are like eloquent <laughs> closing words. <laughs> For this session, I mean, really, that's great. That hits the nail on the head. Thanks. Hey, want to thank the panel and. Um